This is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, with a follow-up video to last week's lesson about the work of Lily Boulanger. I said I'd make this video if I got 100 likes, and you came through with far more than that in only a couple of days. So here it is. If you can also like this video, that would really help me keep track of how many viewers are currently following this series. I'd like to add more of these lessons in the near future as my schedule allows. If you just stumbled onto this video for the first time, I recommend that you go back and view part one first, to get a little background on Lily and her significance to French music. Also, while there's still time, please click the link that I've provided to hear my Radio New Zealand Concert FM special, in which I detail her tragically short life and the amazingly potent music she was able to compose in a mere eight years while battling a terminal illness. Let's get back to the score, Vieille et Prière Bouddhique, the old Buddhist prayer for chorus and orchestra. We left off last time at rehearsal mark two at the start of page five. Up to now, the altos and basses have been singing the melody in octaves, punctuated by closing wordless phrases in the tenors and sopranos. The main texture has been for the strings and first harp to play chords, while the clarinets and horns play in unison with the chorus. But now Boulanger changes everything. The winds and second harp take over the chordal texture, while the strings play a complementary line that both reinforces and counterpoints the continuing altos and basses. Let's take these ten bars of exquisitely orchestrated music apart, starting with the melodic content. If you're familiar with French pronunciation, then you know that words tend to be accented on the last syllable. In setting the text to evoke a religious chant, Boulanger makes sure that the final syllable ends up on the downbeat of each following bar, sometimes using quarter note triplets to get the accents to line up. That's a pretty common approach in general with French text setting. Here's what's unique about this piece. The melodic content is severely restricted to only two notes, G and B-flat. The composer wants to convey a sense of hypnotic devotion on the one hand. On the other, she wants the vocal line to be intentionally simple, so that two other factors may be complex, the harmonic progression of the winds and the contrapuntal line of the strings. Counterpoint was Lily Boulanger's specialty as a student. She made it a point to study the fugue and received top marks at the Paris Conservatoire. After winning the Prix de Rome, she wrote many passages like this in which she experiments with counterpoint to create different effects and enhance certain emotional directions. Here she's using it to enhance a sense of mystery and tension. While the voices chant those simple G's and B-flats, the strings recap the melody from a few bars before. The passage is so cleverly constructed that even though the strings and the chorus are essentially walking all over each other's notes, the idea is completely clear. Now that we've got a handle on the melody and counter melody, let's look at the chordal accompaniment of the winds. In this chart, I've colored the different tones of each chord in each bar so that you can see which instrument is playing which step. It's a rich texture, with the winds playing in their lower registers for the most part. The French horns play octaves in their middle to low register. There are lots of doublings here, with the bass clarinets often doubling the second clarinet or first bassoon the sarousaphone doubling the second bassoon, and the English horn doubling the first oboe for the whole passage on that top G. The second harp plays along with most of the notes in these chords, but sometimes has a unique note that changes the harmonic identity. I've marked those notes in pink. As it did in lesson one, the harmony revolves around the common tone of G above middle C. But now Boulanger stretches the possibilities of what other chords might reasonably share that note. The first two bars are the same pair of chords from before, B flat minor 13 resolving to a G fifth. Then she takes middle C out of the next chord, making the subtle difference of the G being an added sixth, not a thirteenth. The C is gone because she's springing a surprise on us, a new resolution chord of E minor, and she doesn't want us to feel a half step down to the new fifth of B.
Now she throws a D-flat sharp 11 chord at us. That sounds way out, but it's just the relative major chord of B-flat minor, plus the added augmented fourth of G natural. Nothing too weird, but then look what the resolution chord is. A-flat minor major. Here the G acts as a major 7, adding a tritone to the top of the chord. Now for the wildest step of all. F flat minor sharp 11. Here the G is essentially an A double flat, giving us the minor third. But it's written as a G because the melody goes B flat A G, B flat A G, B flat A G. The B flat here acts as a true sharp 11. It can't be an augmented fourth because of the A, nor a flat fifth because of the C flat. And where does Lili resolve to? A simple, devastatingly effective G fifth. The game ends with that D flat sharp 11 chord also resolving to a G fifth. But wait a second, isn't F flat minor the same thing as E minor? If there's an E minor back there, then why can't we just express the harmony over here in the same terms? There are two reasons. One is that it's just simpler for those instruments playing an A-flat chord in the bar before to transition to F-flat and stay on flat notes. But the other reason goes into one of the finer points of instrumentation, harp pedaling. To really explain this in detail would take a few minutes. Maybe I'll make that part two of my long-neglected harp scoring playlist soon. Suffice to say that the harp's pedals are set for four flats in the bar before. It's simpler to lift two pedals to get to F-flat minor than it is to press down to to get to E minor. Now that we've carefully explored the function and touched on the balance and texture, let's hear that passage again. Listen to how it all fits together, the low register cushion of the winds, rich in overtones, and yet somehow behind the strings and voice, the voice and strings pulling apart and coming back together as the harmonic relationships become ever more complex. That takes us to the phrase leading into Rehearsal Mark III. Now here's an interesting study in orchestral balance. The tension has been building throughout this episode as the elements of orchestral color and function push at the harmonic possibilities. Now Lili is going to drive home the idea with a big gesture, followed by little waves of lapping resolutions going into the upcoming solo break. But forget about the function for a minute, and look at that big dynamic arc purely in terms of balance. After fighting each other for ten bars, the strings and chorus now join in a mighty unison line, fortissimo for the strings and crescendo for the chorus. Once again, this is a blending tone, not a supporting tone, as the chorus is actually down one dynamic notch at forte. Lending just the tiniest bit of bite to the attack of each note are both harps joining the octave unison melody. Also joining in are the first and second horns at mezzo forte. This is a very carefully balanced melody, and if the conductor really does their work, then the sound is truly epic. That's somewhat textbook in orchestral choral writing, though. What's more interesting is how she supports the melody, and the reasoning behind her choice of instruments. Two bars before figure three, the clarinets and bass clarinets start crescendoing into the big gesture but then cut off suddenly in the following bar, overlapping with the entrance of the trombones. Note the balance issues here. The clarinets are increasing from mezzo forte to forte, but a low register clarinet forte is equal to mezzo forte for trombones on the same pitches. Meanwhile, the oboes and English horn are playing a simple row of descending chords above, G minor, F minor, E flat, then ending on a D fourth. 
These chords are doubled by muted trumpets playing pianissimo. It's a fascinating color. The dry sharpness of the trumpets reinforces the cutting edge of the double reeds, but subtly, not obviously. And yet the position of the chords interacts with the sonorities of both the trombones and the strings to round out the tone, so that it blends well and has punch. One last little detail, a confirmation of my principle of horizontal continuity. Some of my longtime viewers will recall this little video from my intro series from a few years back, in which I said, Sometimes uh, composers uh, in the 19th century would write things into their symphonies that would actually allow players to warm up. So by the time they got to a big, splashy part, bam, they would be able to do it. That's true here. The composer could easily have scored this whole section with no heavy brass at all, just continuing to use horns and winds in interesting combinations. Instead, she gives the trumpets and trombones a few bars to wake up their embouchures for the big push coming up in a couple of minutes. It keeps the whole orchestra engaged to add little touches like this, and makes for a much more interesting part for all the players. What I've given you so far is an example of the way I think when I score read. The difference is that I see all the information on the page at once, and it's translated in many ways to give me a complete picture of the composer's intentions. Now I could go on in this way, picking apart different sections and describing every nuance, every clever bit of craft, but I'm honestly afraid that you'll never learn to think for yourself. What was that other point I made way back in 2009? If you make things too easy on your ear, then it will never develop. So here are a set of exercises for you in understanding the rest of this score in a deeper way, while strengthening your inner musical workshop. Read through the solo section. Note how the second flute takes over seamlessly to give the first flute some time to breathe and rest their chops. Then go through the harmony for the first passage, using the harps for a reference. The harmonic changes become so complex that the harps have to trade off from bar to bar, changing most or even all of their pedals to cope with the next bar. Once you have a handle on the harmony, then play through the supporting lines in the bass clarinets, bassoons, and horns. Remember that the transposition for the bass clarinet when scored in bass clef like this is down a whole step to play concert pitch, and the transposition for the horns is down a perfect fifth. Finally, listen again to the passage and note how all the tonalities work to create a mysterious floating texture, especially the muted second violins playing oscillating tremolo fourths doubled by the muted pizzicato violas. That's an incredibly delicate texture, especially as the violins are playing sul tosto, in French, sur la touche, over the fingerboard. First, score read from figure four to the beginning of page 16. Pay close attention to the tenor line and what part of the range the melody favors during which parts of the text setting. As you go, watch for doubling, like the English horn and clarinet on pages 12 and 13, and the oboe on page 14. Also watch for counter melodies, like the cellos and horns on page 12, and the violins and flutes on page 13. Then go back to figure four and play through the string part with your left hand covering the cellos and your right hand clustering all of those back and forth notes into one big chord. Leave out those violin melodies on page 13. Watch how complex the changes are getting and how much further away from the original tonal center of a simple G fifth. And yet Lili somehow gets us back there by the start of page 17. Once you've given that a go, 
Then listen to this section again and look for all the textural elements and how they balance. The strings are still sul tasto, playing divisi, pizzicato, and arco. This is an intriguing sound, and it also has a particular look and feel when it's performed live, with each desk playing either one way or another. When it's done with delicacy and precision, it's a magical effect. The big surge on page 13 is nicely supported by winds and horns, but I find pages 14 and 15 even more intriguing, with the return of the harp chords and the celesta doubling the first section first violins. The thing that's neat here is that the lowest octave of the celesta is a little unclear and used mainly to support upper tones and chords, but when used by itself it has a rather ambiguous sound with strange overtones. It's just another example of Boulanger's mastery of orchestration and incredible ear. Now apply everything you've learned so far to pages 16 and 17, and see how the orchestra and chorus arrive at that final eerie texture by the second bar of page 18. Once again, Lili uses the complex overtones of the wind section to make you hear things that don't actually exist, like the carryover of the strings and harmonics from a few bars before. At this point, the finale starts. This is a section that's mostly built out of contrapuntal lines, with lower winds and brass underpinning things harmonically. It will really build your ear to take all these lines apart, and see how Boulanger plays one against the other, pacing the mood, and building a texture out of the multiple functions. She makes it sound effortless, but it must have taken a great deal of calculation and hard work. Then she builds another texture out of pentatonic patterns, leading to the awesome final chord. The way all of these bits and pieces fit together is worth taking apart and studying. I love these blazing seas in the brass that ring out over the collapsing orchestra. Finally, Observe the last tutti chords construction. It's perfectly balanced, with all sections of the orchestra placed just right for the maximum impact. Here you see the benefit of setting the piece in C minor. Those strings can hit these chords hard with many open strings for that final stroke. The harps don't upsweep in some cliché Hollywood ending, but instead pluck a massive unison C, with their B strings also tuned to B sharp. This adds some tone weight to the basses and cellos, even if it can't be heard as a distinct sound. As cool as this piece is, it's still a minor work compared to Lili Boulanger's major cantatas like Psalm 30, De Profundis, or her prize-winning cantata, Faust et Dilein. Perhaps her greatest accomplishment was the set of sister works, Du Matin de Printemps and D'un Soir Triste, which she completed just before she died in 1918. In my view, these two pieces elevate her to the level of any of the composers of her time, including Stravinsky, Ravel, Debussy, and Richard Strauss. So in conclusion, I'd like to invite any of my viewers out there to be on the lookout for these scores. Right now, Vieille Prière Boudique is the only fully orchestrated work by Boulanger available for study on imslp.org. But several orchestral works were published in the 1920s and are now public domain. They belong to the world. That means you and I should be able to study them and learn from them. The orchestral scores to D'un Matin de Printemps and D'un Soir Triste were never published, but if there's a facsimile copy of the original manuscript somewhere out there, 
That is also public domain and should be shared. If I saw the Psalm 24 or Psalm 30 up on IMSLP, or Faust et Elaine, or even better, those two incredible orchestral pieces, I would definitely return to the subject of Lili's orchestration for more analysis and assignments. So that's all for now. <laughs> wow, I am so behind in my other work right now. But I promise to return to these lessons in a few weeks, with more biography and orchestration training. Until then, do the score reading and the assignments in this score, and listen to more of Lili's amazing music. See you soon. <laughs>